Egypt was one of the earliest of the great civilizations which arose independently on Earth 5,000 years ago. The monuments the ancient Egyptians left behind, like this, the Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza, are still among the most impressive and the most long-lasting creations of humanity. In the pyramid are enshrined some of the central concerns of their culture. Concerns shared by all civilizations, even by the modern West. But no civilization held them for longer or more tenaciously than the ancient Egyptians. Over the last 20 years, we in the Western world have become painfully aware of how our well-being is inextricably bound up with that of nature. And that understanding has given us a fresh insight into the psychology of Egyptian civilization, their attitude to religious cult, to rulership, to the afterlife, and to the idea of the unchanging stability of the cosmos. And what more dramatic illustration can there be in the whole world than the Great Pyramid, and this room in particular, of the human yearning for immutability? for the human concern for life after death. And the fact that this place has the power to move us so much after so many millennia, whatever culture we come from, is a testimony surely not only to its grandeur of conception and execution, marvelous as that is, but also to the fact that we still share the impulse which lies behind it. And in that sense, we of the late 20th century, for all our modernity, are still Bronze Age people. Since ancient times, the Egyptians have experienced so many changes, above all in the triumph of Islam, that they might appear now to be cut off forever from the age of the pharaohs. But perhaps there is a deeper sense in which a society's ideals are passed on, a habit of civilization. Do you really believe, wrote the novelist Tawfiq al-Hakim, that the thousands of years that make up Egypt's past could have vanished without trace, as if in a dream? The Nile, said the great Arab traveler Ibn Battuta, surpasses all the rivers of the world in sweetness of taste, in length of course and utility. The civilization of Egypt, like those of Iraq, India and China, drew its life from a river. But this was a country like no other. Running for 600 miles between dunes and cliffs, a narrow ribbon of blue water and green fields, on average only six miles wide. This geography shaped the civilization. Where the spirit of Iraq was pessimistic, here when the Nile flooded each year, as the ancients said, the fields laugh, men's faces light up, 
and God rejoices in his heart. From the life-renewing soil left by the inundation, the Egyptians drew a cheerful confidence in humanity, in the permanence and stability of things. Theirs was an optimistic civilization. Their civilization grew out of a long prehistory of culture in the Nile Valley the coming together of many small egalitarian farming communities, communities sustained as today by hard-working peasantry, tilling the soil, creating an elaborate filigree of ditches and dikes to capture the annual flood. The Aswan High Dam, built in 1970, may have changed this age-old rhythm, but today's Egypt still depends on the tillers, the fellahin, and what the ancients called the Black Earth. Not long before 3000 BC, these local cultures were unified into a single state, the first in history. And here at the very beginning, there are clues which will determine the shape of Egyptian civilization right down to the Islamic period. Our search begins in an obscure little village in Upper Egypt called Qom el Ahmar, the Red Mound. This was the center of a prehistoric tribal kingdom, shrine of a local divinity called Horus, the Hawk. Hence its Greek name, Hierakonpolis, Hawk Town. This, this is the old kingdom town. In 1897, two British archaeologists, Quibell and Green, came here looking for the origins of Egypt. About 20 years ago, the Americans came back to the same place. In a field beyond the village, they made a stunning discovery, a heap of ceremonial pallets and mace heads from the ritual stores of Egypt's first kings, kings called cobra, catfish, scorpion, hawk. So, so the, so the old kingdom temple is this whole area here, the Temple of Horus. Yeah. Is that right? Good all, all Didn't Egypt begin here? The first kings, I think. The first king was here in the Kobra. They were all the area. Did any of their fathers um, mm. work on, on uh, those excavations? Uh, 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 yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Among the finds was perhaps the most significant object ever dug up in Egypt. A slab of black slate two feet long, cut with scenes commemorating the deeds of a king called Nama, whom legend said was the unifier of Egypt. Here is the very moment of Nama's triumph. Wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, he dashes out the brains of the captive king of the Delta. Headless enemies lie in rows before the standards of Horus the Hawk. And already a superhuman aura surrounds the king himself, an aura of divinity. Ninety years on, it's very difficult to see any trace of those momentous discoveries here in the area where the pallets and the mace heads were found. But a year later, Green made an equally intriguing find in the same area. He came across the remains of a large circular mound of clean white sand about 50 yards across and 8 feet high, enclosed by a sloping sandstone revetment. There was evidence of a of a walkway leading to some central feature. Green thought the dating was prehistoric, before the first kings of dynastic Egypt, and he interpreted the mound as being a symbolic representation of the mound of creation itself, the first island which had risen out of the seas of chaos at the beginning of time, and on which the first life had landed, the hawk. The divine kingship of Horus would last as long as ancient Egypt itself. 
Here in the great temple at Edfu, that same creation myth would be expounded in loving detail for colonial Greek overlords nearly three millennia after Nama's day. It was at the heart of the Egyptian conception of civilization. Every Egyptian temple then was a symbolic representation of that original mound of creation with that simple reed shrine surrounding the perch on which the hawk had landed, which was created at Hierakon Polis. And no matter how big the temples became in later ages, the Holy of Holies was still that simple reed shrine depicted here at Edfu. 3,000 years later, you can make out the line of reeds surrounding the chamber in which the image of the hawk was kept. The temple was not only, though, a depiction of the first place, but of the first time, the time when the pattern of a stable society was handed down to humankind, of kingship, law, religion and ritual, a pattern which it was believed would suffice for eternity as long as the rituals were correctly performed. The universe then and civil society were conceived of as static, Progress, change, new questions, new answers were not required because they were not needed. And indeed, they wouldn't be needed until Alexander the Great conquered Egypt three millennia later. For the Egyptians then, divine kingship was the guarantee of a stable cosmos. The same idea can be traced across the world from Shang, China to Aztec, Mexico. And here at Abydos, those first kings of Egypt were buried with immense brick mortuary temples like earthly palaces. And so the key themes of Egyptian history were laid down. Centralized power, royal rituals and the cult of the dead intertwined to form the ideology of the world's first state themes still potent, even in our own day. Moving northwards along the Nile, the narrow valley meets the green expanse of the delta. At this strategic point, close by today's capital, Cairo, the Horus kings built their royal city, Memphis. On the sandstone escarpment above the floodplain is the great funeral complex of the Third Dynasty kings. Here at Saqqara, the mud brick architecture of Abydos was turned into stone. immense 200-foot high tomb of King Jose, the first of the pyramids. In a handful of generations around 2500 BC, a series of gifted kings, Huni, Senefru, Khufu, Khafre, building bigger and bigger as each seems to try to outdo his predecessor, created the greatest series of funeral monuments the world has ever seen. The most famous, the Giza pyramids, are now all but engulfed by the suburbs of Cairo, stripped of their polished limestone casing and plundered for building stone but still awesome. There are many myths surrounding the building of the pyramids. The Hollywood epic version had slave gangs whipped along by tyrannical masters. But Egypt was not a slave society. The mass of the workforce was not enslaved. In a long reign, it was perfectly possible for a government to mobilize huge-scale state employment to build such monuments, using the workforce in the wet season 
when the Nile flood left idle hands. From the graffiti in the quarries, we can get some idea of the character of the gangs who built these pyramids. The tough gang, the boys who stay forever, Khufu's boys. But exactly how it was done, uh, there's very little evidence for. Uh, they must have worked from an enormous ramp running from the river um, with uh, feeder, uh, feeder supports of wood and earth perhaps to bring the, the stones round. Uh, the Greek traveller Herodotus, who came here in the 450s BC, said that uh, he was told by tour guides that it took 20 years with the gangs of 100,000 men to do it. The ancient Greeks, with typical cockiness, called them pyramids after the triangular cakes they knew back home. We can see them now in the light of the artificial mountains built by other cultures, Babylonians, Maya and Aztec. For all civilizations have sought validation for their power over the masses by creating great public symbols. But more than that, the dead king is now a manifestation of the sun god himself. When the construction job was finished, the pyramids were covered with a, a case of fine Tura limestone. And although most of that has disappeared over the centuries, you can see over there on Kefren's pyramid, the top coating is still there. That's what they looked like. But what were they for? They were tombs, but what did the shape mean? Well, the pyramid clearly was what it seems to be, a staircase on which the king's spirit could ascend to heaven and then go back to his tomb. And what we're looking at over here is an image of the rays of the sun god coming down to earth. A typical piece of the Egyptian imagination in which an immaterial concept is represented in such a material form. And on winter's days here in Giza, you can actually sit here and watch the sun breaking through the clouds and falling down at the same angle as the pyramids. A stairway to heaven then, the rays of the sun on which the king, nimble and wise, could ascend to the indestructible stars. The Egyptians created the world's first unified state. In modern terms, it was a provider state, providing a basic standard of living to all its people through control of irrigation, in return for enormous surpluses to be spent on tombs, temples and palaces. Through these great buildings, it expressed its ideologies of power, its belief in the indivisibility of divine and earthly rule, in the need for a stable cosmos. Such ideas may have been essential needs of civilization at the start. And yet even today, almost all of us still live in nation states with some or all of those same characteristics. Our thinking is still shaped by their religious and social myths, and especially by the myth of the great ruler, king or god. For it was in his name in the Bronze Age that the many surrendered power to the few to live in the condition in which most of the people of the planet still live today. Worship of the great ruler was perhaps a necessary stage in the development of civilization. But even now, in the TV age, Kings and presidents and popes use the vast array of visual aids invented here and which we see all around us to boost their authority. And do we not still engage in ruler worship ourselves whenever we cheer a presidential motorcade as it sweeps by or celebrate the jubilee of the Queen of England as she passes escorted by beef eaters in 16th century costume? or watch musketeers give an antiquated salute on the White House lawn. 
Perhaps then we are only just emerging from the spell of the Bronze Age Revolution which created civilization and shaped our ways of thinking. In the long term in history, we are perhaps still too close to them to see ourselves as we really are. In ancient Egypt, the ties binding people to the state were not only economic, but religious. And the great event in its religious life was the pilgrimage to Abydos. Each year, thousands of people set out for the little town in Middle Egypt to celebrate the resurrection of Osiris, king of the dead. The pilgrimage provided a focus for the feelings of ordinary Egyptians, and rather like Hindus today at Banaras or Shia Muslims at Kerbala, many asked to be brought to Abydos for burial. And at Abydos, we find another of Egypt's great legacies to the world. It's still a haunting place, cradled in an immense curve of the western cliffs, the realm of the dead. A holy place since prehistory. In the ruins of the sacred city, the temple of Seti I, built in 1300 BC, still survives. It's one of the peaks of ancient art. Moving from daylight into its darkened inner sanctum, the visitor has an uncanny intimation of a still active residue of spiritual power. Long before the Christians and Muslims, even ordinary Egyptians came to believe in an eternal soul, in a last judgment, and in resurrection after death. These great conceptions were acted out in a public passion play at Abydos and are depicted on the temple walls here as a rite of passage for King Seti himself. Here too are many motifs familiar to Christians, especially the role of the Divine Mother, Isis. Here Isis is caressing Seti on her knee and she says to him, You're my son, come out of me. I have nourished you that you may be lord of the two lands. I have made your body strong in victory against all the enemies who may come against you. Your majesty is king of eternity, a falcon abiding forever. And here's Isis giving the breath of life to Seti. And above her, her words are, you have made your mansion, your temple, to magnify our nature and adorned it with all kinds of excellent stonework and your reward for this will be the lifespan of the sky or as long as Abydos shall exist. At first sight these gestures and actions may seem rather archaic and bizarre but if you just step back a little and think for example what a Muslim or a Buddhist or even a Protestant would make of seeing for the first time a solemn Roman Catholic Mass. Then a lot of those tender gestures which are so familiar to Christians would lose their meaning. In all religions in the world 
simple and often strange gestures can carry profound truths. And it was just the same in Egyptian religion, which certainly did not lack ethical content. But the key to understanding the function of this great building lies in these little chapels just at the end of this room. In this inner shrine is the climax to the whole ritual. It's concerned with the installation of King Seti, not only as Osiris's heir as a living king, but with his union with Osiris after death. And here, Isis and Horus perform rituals for him, and Seti is now dead and deified. Here, he's represented as a mummy in a white wrap. And over there on the far wall, blackened by smoke and age, Seti, restored to the colours of living flesh and blood, comes into the presence of Osiris, where he will become one, resurrected himself, with the resurrected King of the Dead. So the simple and strange gestures reveal a simple yet profound message, a belief in righteousness on earth, in the last judgment, in eternal life, though not in damnation, which had no place in the Egyptians' optimistic view of things. But these ideas would play a key role in the later development of Christianity and of Islam. Out in the desert at Abydos, millions of broken pots still lie where the ancient pilgrims left them as offerings to their god. For them, the wind roaring down the great gorge in the western cliffs was the sound of the spirits of the dead, whose annual pilgrimage to Osiris, they believed, would continue as long as Abydos exists. In 332 BC, Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great. And then, Egyptian civilization turned away from its immemorial roots towards the sea and a wider world. On the Mediterranean coast, a new capital was founded, which became the meeting place of Europe and Asia on the shore of Africa, Alexandria. The greatest market in the inhabited world wrote the Roman Strabo, beacon to traders from all nations who came by land and sea, bearing spices from South India and the treasures of the Silk Route to China. It's paradise here, said the poet Herodas. You can get anything you want. Money, shows, games, women, wine, boys, the best library in the world. In short, all earthly delights. Like 20s New York, Hellenistic Alexandria was a land of opportunities whose streets were paved with gold. It drew immigrants of all kinds, bankers, clerks, engineers, poets, even religious dropouts. These extraordinary mummy portraits allow us literally to look into the eyes of such people even we feel to sense their hopes and fears. Vain and violent, rich and prosperous, it was said, they've only one God here, Mammon. Our good life in Alexandria was brief, wrote the poet Cavafy. But how potent were the perfumes, how splendid the bed on which we lay, and to what sensual delight we gave our bodies. Down here in the catacombs of Alexandria, you can still enter that weird and wonderful world where Egyptian and Greek and Jewish and Oriental religion and magic met and intermingled. The Greeks who came here to Egypt were very open-minded about the local gods. They 
deep experience of Mediterranean paganism made it easy for them to identify Amun with Zeus, or to say the, the Egyptians worshipped Aphrodite, the goddess of love, but they called her Hathor. And how that worked in practice, you can see in this astonishing tomb deep below the streets of Alexandria. At first sight, it looks like a typically Egyptian tomb with papyrus columns and the winged disc of the sun behind and the row of cobra's heads. But when you look closer, you notice human figures in ancient Egyptian poses but with Greco-Roman faces. On each side of the door, guardian serpents, but carrying the snake-entwined staff of Hermes, the Greek guide of souls, and above them, Medusa's heads. And when you go inside the tomb itself, you can see that the sarcophagi are decorated with traditional Greek motifs, bunches of grapes, wreaths, cattle skulls and masks. But above them are the ancient gods of Egypt. There's Isis protecting the sacred bull with her wings. And over here, Thoth, the god of wisdom, the falcon-headed Horus, tending to the mummy of the dead. And here even, the jackal-headed Anubis, the guardian of the dead, wearing Greco-Roman military gear. This, then, is the strange synthesis that emerged in Greek Egypt. It was said that Alexander had hoped to create a new world order based on his multiracial ideal of brotherhood among nations. But with hindsight, ironically, we can see that his Hellenistic empire actually laid the cultural foundations of Islam. When he died in Babylon, aged 32, Alexander's body was brought back for burial in a lavish tomb in Alexandria. It's never been found, but the clues point to this tiny mosque in the heart of the old city. An Arab traveller who came here in the 9th century AD described this place as the mosque of the two-horned prophet strange echo of the ram's horn helmet with which the Egyptian priests of Amun had crowned Alexander the Great. And through the Middle Ages, it was revered not only as the tomb of the prophet Daniel, which is still down there, but also as the tomb of the king and prophet Iskander, Alexander the Great himself. cellars that fan out from underneath this mosque have never been explored properly. But that's not really surprising. The city's absolutely honeycombed with them and they're really dangerous. There's a great Alexandrian story of the fat bride who, on her wedding procession, fell through a hole in the street and disappeared. And despite the best efforts of the guests, she was never seen again. In 1850, a servant at the Russian consulate came down here and got lost in the corridors. When he came out, he said that he'd seen in a gap in the stonework a chamber with a glass coffin and a human body with a gold diadem round its head and fragments of papyrus everywhere. That description closely matches the last classical witnesses of the tomb of Alexander the Great but suspiciously so, he was probably lying. Nevertheless, it's an intriguing thought that the solution to the greatest mystery in the history of Alexandria could lie somewhere behind one of these blocked up corridors. It's 3 a.m. in the remote monastery of St. Paul, near the Red Sea. The monks begin their devotions before dawn.
These are Christian Copts. Their name means Egyptians, and their language and music contain survivals from Pharaonic times. Their culture goes back to the early centuries AD, when Egypt became part of a Christian Roman Empire. And even today, they represent nearly 10% of Egypt's population. This church was founded in the third century AD by St. Paul the Anchorite. And with the Christians, we come to the second great foreign transformation of the native culture of the Nile Valley. In late Roman Egypt, an upheaval began as momentous as any political revolution, a change in the psyche of Near Eastern culture which has helped shape the Western mind ever since. A vision of life which believed in withdrawal from the world, monasticism. At this time, the blue water and emerald fields of the Nile Valley were exchanged for the inhospitable desert. There are strange parallels with our own time in the widespread feeling that civilization itself had failed. Better cities may arise one day, said the Egyptian philosopher Plotinus. Our children, though conceived in a sinful age, may build better than their fathers. And so the old fabric of pagan culture, the stable cosmos which had sustained Egyptians for so long, was eroded by Christianity, with its appeal not to a great earthly ruler, but to a distant high god. This was a time, said one, when we realized how insecure the human condition is. These fateful changes were mirrored in the way people saw the world. For nearly a thousand years, classical Mediterranean art had glorified the physical world in the belief that mankind, as the Greeks said, was the measure of all things. Now artists retreat into a crude language of symbols. To us, in the age of Freud and Jung, it looks like a failure of nerve, a loss of faith in the material world, perhaps even deeper psychic trauma. Everything has gone, said Cyprian. Honesty, friendship, skill in the arts, standards in morals. This vast and wonderful world is heading for destruction. And so, with St. Paul of Egypt, the stage was set for fundamentalists of all persuasions to fight over the legacy of the ancients.
A revolution of the mind was now in process. And out of this crisis, a new religion would emerge as the dominant culture of the whole region. In 641, Egypt was conquered by Muslim Arabs bearing a new gospel, that of the Prophet Muhammad. And here in Edfu, the town of Horus, ordinary Egyptian people in their mud-brick slums around the temple soon began to abandon the uncertainties of the past for the certainties of a single god, Islam. And so, here in Edfu, in Upper Egypt, as throughout the Mediterranean and Near Eastern worlds, the Christians and the Muslims were the inheritors of the ancients. And their belief in a single god, which the Muezzins are chanting now from their minarets, developed out of a tendency long apparent in the ancient world. For the, the Catholic papacy, the Muslim caliphate, the Orthodox churches of the Greeks and Syrians and Copts, all stem from the attempt of men to rule their fellow men and women under a distant, high and all-powerful god. And the effects of that tremendous revolution at the end of the late antique world still shape our lives today. The last Greek religious papyrus from 7th century Egypt sets the seal on that revolution. For it gives in Greek the very words we can hear around us now. In the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate, there is one God and one God alone. And it goes on in Greek, Mahmed, Apostolos Diou. Muhammad is the Apostle of God. With that, to all intents and purposes, the world of the ancient Egyptians had passed. The change to Islam would take many centuries. And out in the countryside, especially in Upper Egypt, the deeper layers of the past are still visible today. It's the eve of the full moon in mid-March, heralding the onset of the heat of summer. And at this time, tens of thousands of people come in from the countryside to descend on the little town of Luxor for a great annual festival. Up here, people still celebrate the ancient feast days, the spring festival, the rising of the Nile, and especially the 40 days of mourning for the dead. But this is the biggest. It's a Muslim festival for an Islamic saint, but it takes place at a mosque inside one of the great pagan temples of ancient Egypt. The Coptic Christians take part too, for they also once had a church inside the temple. The saint himself, Abul Haggag, died in the 11th century, at the point when Islam was becoming the majority religion here. His tomb inside the mosque has been a place of pilgrimage ever since. As everywhere, orthodoxy may demand one thing, but what the people do is another matter. And in the worship of sheikhs and saints, the ordinary people, the fellaheen, fill the void between their daily hopes and fears and that distant high god. The night is passed in passionate celebration with the traditional music and songs of Upper Egypt. The two lands may have been united 5,000 years ago, but the South is still a distinct country, and tonight a man from the Delta would be a complete stranger here.
Next day, the festival reaches its climax. The living descendants of the saint lead a huge procession around the ancient temple and its mosque, bearing representations of the coffins of Hagag and his sons. Bringing up the procession are Luxor's guild of ferrymen bearing boats. They're on trucks these days, but nonetheless, the ferrymen are discharging their traditional duty, just as their ancestors did thousands of years ago, when around the streets of ancient Luxor, they bore the boat of the sun god Amun. The day ends not in solemnity, but in carnival and license. The ancient legacy also survived in the city. Cairo, the mother of cities, as Ibn Battuta said. Its numberless buildings peerless in their beauty and splendor. The meeting place of travelers, shelter of the strong and weak, whose throngs of people surge like the sea. Founded in sight of the ancient capital Memphis and the pyramids of Giza and Saqqara, Cairo has long been the cultural capital of Arab Islam. And here too, even today, in its mosques and universities, we can still find a living link with the world of the pharaohs. A civilization conservative in character, like its ancient predecessor. Here in the Al-Azhar, the leading teaching mosque of Islam, older than Oxford or the Sorbonne, learning is still the study of the sacred texts, binding the land together as it did in ancient Egypt. In city and countryside, then, the modern Egyptians still do some of the things their ancestors did, for all the apparently cataclysmic breaks in their history. Now here in Cairo in the late 14th century, those questions were examined by the greatest of all Islamic historians, Ibn Khaldun. His concerns were the same as ours in these films, the nature of civilization, its rise and decline. He considered that settled, cooperative human life was the goal of civilization, that it went in cycles of growth and decay like all forms of life. He thought, incidentally, that overconsumption in society was an inevitable cause of decline, but that under certain favorable conditions of geography and climate and the character and customs of the people, culture could acquire a rootedness that he called the habit of civilization. And in all history, Egypt was perhaps the best example of that habit. The pharaohs, he points out, had political power for 3,000 years. They were followed by the Greeks and the Romans, and then the legacy taken on by Islam. So the habit of civilization was continuous here. Nowhere else in the world was it more firmly rooted. And that perhaps explains Egypt's continuing cultural leadership in the Islamic world today. At the beginning lay the early Egyptian state, the first comprehensive attempt in human history to satisfy the needs of men and women to live together in an ordered state with a degree of happiness and material well-being. And so far, it's been one of the most successful. And so, even after the triumph of Islam, the legacy of the pharaohs did not give up all its numinous power. And it has not yet.